Thank you all. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everybody. We are back for our afternoon session here. This is the April docket of the uh, Kansas Court of Appeals sitting here at Johnson County Community College. We're so very grateful and happy to be here. This is a, we try to come here once a year in April for hearings and it's a good experience for both of us. So we're happy to be here. Uh, I am Judge Tom Malone. To my right is Judge Stephen Hill. To my left is Judge Michael Boozer. We are the panel for uh, today's cases. Uh, I'll call the cases in the order of the published docket. Uh, for the attorneys, when I call your name, please come forward. We do have counsel, makeshift counsel table for you. Uh, please let us know your appearance, especially if your name is not on the brief, so that we get that accurate for our records. Uh, as most of you probably know, we have read your briefs uh, in advance of today's hearings. So we are familiar with the facts of your case and what the legal issues are. You might keep that in mind as you make your arguments during the limited amount of time that you have. As the presiding judge, I'll be the uh, timekeeper. Each party is given 15 minutes <clears throat> for your argument unless it's designated differently on the docket. Uh, and we may have one of those cases this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, but anyway, if there's more than one attorney per side, you need to let us know in advance how you wish to divide your time. Also, the appellant attorney should let us know if you wish to reserve any of your time for rebuttal. After, after the hearings today, your case will be deemed submitted for decision, and we will take the case under advisement and get a written opinion out to you and your clients just as soon as we possibly can. So with that background, I'll go ahead and call the first case this afternoon. Uh, it is a case uh, here from Johnson County. It's 110-454. Uh, it's entitled The State of Kansas versus Emmanuel Alley, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. One thing I'd like to do today uh, for the benefit of the students here in the audience and also those watching us, this is being video streamed, uh, I'd like to give a very brief summary, a written summary of the facts of each case and what the issues are. So if you'll indulge me, I'll do that here. Uh, in this case, we're about to hear the facts are as follows, summarized. Uh, on October 31st, 2011, uh, W.H. had an argument with Emmanuel Alley, the defendant in this case, uh, whom W.H. Uh, believed she was exclusively dating uh, after she thought she saw him with another woman. Uh, although Alley denied the accusation, W.H. told him their relationship was over. That evening, W.H. had sexual contact with Ellie's friend, Rodney Blue, and fell asleep in Blue's apartment. Later that night, Ellie came to Blue's apartment and physically attacked W.H. As a result of these events, a jury convicted Ellie of rape, aggravated kidnapping, and aggravated battery. A couple of the primary issues are issue number one, was there evidence that L.A. confined W.H. by force or threat sufficient to support the kidnapping conviction? Another issue, does the kidnapping statute create alternative means of committing the crime? A third issue is, did the district court err by holding W.H. was unavailable as a witness uh, and that the state had made adequate efforts to locate her which led to the court allowing the state to present her testimony through her preliminary hearing transcript. So that's just a very brief summary of what the issues in this case are. So if counsel are ready, we can go ahead and proceed. 
And for the appellant, we have Christina Curls of the Appellate Defender Office for Mr. Elliott. And for the appellee, the State of Arizona, Steve Ms. Curls, whenever you're ready. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, please. Okay. And I'd like to focus my argument on the first issue in the brief and submit the others on the brief unless this court has questions. Um, the first issue in the brief is sufficiency relating to the aggravating kidnapping charge. And just as a preliminary matter, uh, I want to clarify, because the state framed this as a jury instruction issue as opposed to a sufficiency issue. And our argument is, is that it is a sufficiency issue, even under the alternative means, according to the Supreme Court's um, decision in Wright, a failure to present evidence on each of the alternative means requires reversal for sufficiency. So we framed it as a sufficiency issue because the Kansas Supreme Court has also framed this as a sufficiency issue. And we actually raised sufficiency under two theories, both a straight up insufficient evidence and under an alternative means theory. Um, in its closing argument, the state proffered three different underlying acts which could support the conviction of aggravated kidnapping. That the aggravating kidnapping occurred when Mr. Ellie allegedly dragged WH from the bedroom to the living room, when he, or second, when he shut and locked the apartment door, or third, when he dragged the complaining witness outside. Um, those are the three different theories, and the jury was given a unanimity instruction and told that they had to be unanimous on which one of those theories they used in order to convict um, Mr. Ellie. Um, just for the purposes of this argument, I would like to start with the alternative means because I believe that will actually cover two of those theories, and then I'll address the one that isn't covered by the alternative means argument. Um, the state has conceded that taking and confining are alternative means. Um, however, they argue that the um, mens rea element, the to inflict bodily harm, or to terrorize doesn't create a separate alternative means. And they base their um, opinion on uh, the Kansas Supreme Court decision, Haberline. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But essentially, that, that um, opinion dealt with a separate subsection of the aggravate of the kidnapping statute to facilitate flight or commission of the crime. And we would argue that um, the decision in Haberline, Haberline isn't applicable or isn't directly applicable to this case because that particular subsection at issue in that case had the same intent element. That intent element was to facilitate. <coughs> the options within that subsection were to facilitate flight or to facilitate commission of a crime. That isn't the case here. There is no common intent element within that subsection to ter withhold with the intent to terrorize or hold with the intent to inflict bodily harm. There's not that same mens rea common facilitate as there was at issue in Haberline. So we would argue that there is a even a separate alternative means issue other than simply the taking or confining, um, which would create four different alternative means on which the jury was instructed. And in order for Mr. Ellie to be convicted, the state had to present evidence of each one of those means. Um, Specifically, we um, contend that the state did not present evidence of each one of the means because it did not prove that at any time Mr. Ellie can find WH and that he did any of the acts um, which the state alleged could uh, constitute aggravating kidnapping with the intent to terrorize. What about locking the door to the apartment? Um, I would argue that that's not sufficient. I mean, yes, there is evidence that he locked the door of the apartment, but the it has to the intent has to be to confine Miss Ellie. There was no evidence. Um, first of all, Miss Ellie herself testified through a preliminary hearing, and she she didn't in any way indicate in her testimony that she ever tried to get away. It was Rodney Blue's apartment, and Rodney Blue explained that the lock on his door was an inside deadbolt, and all you had to do was twist it to unlock it. He also testified that when he and Mr. Clark were standing right outside that door, at no time did he see anybody attempt to 
jiggle the handle in any way attempt to get out of the apartment. Additionally, he testified that he heard yelling from both Miss, from both the, but WH and Mr. Ellie, but didn't testify that he ever heard Miss, ever heard WH asking to be let go, asking to be let out. We would argue- But that act of locking that door certainly confines WH to that apartment. I would argue that it doesn't unless she in some way tried to get out. Um, the, the evidence... Let me, ask, let me, the, let me yeah. ask the question this way. Can a person be kidnapped without, without their knowing it? Think about that. <laughs> I, I don't... I, I, I would say no under the definition of confine and that they have to be restricted in some way their freedom to move has to be re, re their freedom to leave has to in some way be restricted and if she never Is it, isn't the intent requirement solely on the defendant I mean I, I I do believe that the intent requirement is on the defendant which um, goes back to what I, I was about to say is that in this case there are I mean there were two other people present mr. blue and mr. Clark they were outside of the apartment Mr. Ellie so they weren't locked. Pre they weren't present. Well, they were outside. They were the in the area. <laughs> they were in the general area. My point being is that because the locking of the door could just as easily have been done to keep them out as WH in, I would argue that there needs to be something more than simply the locking of the door to show that the intent of Mr. Ellie in locking the door was to actually confine WH. And without any sort of other evidence, did that, she know that that was a deadbolt, that she could have just unlocked it from the inside? Does the record show anything like that? We, we don't have any. Um, the record doesn't show that, but she also didn't. Now this time she'd already been struck, right? Am I, am I correct? Am, uh, I might I, have my facts wrong. I, I don't remember exactly when the first strike occurred, whether or not it was before he locked the door or after he locked the door. I honestly do not remember. I would argue that it... It doesn't matter in terms of whether or not the state presented sufficient evidence to establish that he confined her with the intent to hold her for one of the two alternative mens rea elements. The simple act of locking the door could just as easily have been, in fact, more likely have been to keep the other two out as, as Rodney Blue testified that all she would have had to do was reach up and turn the lock and open the door, but there's no evidence that that was even attempted. There was no evidence that she told Mr. Ellie that she wanted to leave. There was no evidence that Mr. Mr. Ellie confined her other than the locking of the door. And given it was just as likely that the intent behind that was to keep the other two out as to keep her in, we would argue that there needed to be something else in order for the evidence to be sufficient that Mr. Ellig actually confined her. Well, if we get past the issue of whether or not she was confined and assume for the moment that she was confined in the apartment when the assailant turned the deadbolt lock and we have two guys outside the house that then can't get in, wouldn't that fall under two, that the kidnapping is, is the confining of a person to, to facilitate flight or the commission of any crime. Wasn't the purpose for turning the deadbolt lock to make sure that the boys outside can't rescue her and he can facilitate and continue beating her up? That wasn't the way it was charged. It was charged under to terrorize yeah. or... Um, so isn't that your argument? Your arguments, they got the wrong because they charged it to inflict bodily injury or terrorize the victim. I, I mean, I, if they had charged it a different way, do you believe that they'd have a better argument, but in, in this case there was no evidence that he, if we assume that that is, that that act of locking the door is confining her, the only evidence is that he did that to inflict bodily harm, not to terrorize. There's no evidence that there were any threats. As Mr. Blue testified, he heard yelling back and forth, but he didn't testify to any threats that were made during that, during that exchange of yelling back and forth. So even if that act of locking the door is considered confinement, which we would still argue that it's not for the reason stated, there still wasn't the evidence that he did that act with the intent to hold her to terrorize her, as opposed to just hold her to inflict the bodily harm. And we 
we agree that under all of the theories proffered by the state, that there was evidence that he did those acts with the intent to inflict bodily harm. We, we agree, our, our issue is that there was no evidence under any of those proffered theories that he did those acts with the intent to terrorize. Even when he, um, Mr. Ellie dragged her outside, while Miss, while WH testified that she had a subjective fear that she was gonna be thrown over the balcony, there was no evidence that he ever communicated any such threat or that he communicated any threat whatsoever. The only evidence was that after he took her outside, he inflicted further bodily harm. So we would argue that under any theory proffered by the state, there was no evidence of intent to terrorize because we have nothing other than infliction of bodily harm. But um, your argument's predicated on the fact that that's a separate alternative means. Ab absolutely. I mean, it, it is absolutely predicated on the fact that intent to terrorize is an alternative to inflict bodily harm. And we, we don't have any Kansas cases on that, do we? We don't. Um, the, the only thing I've found so far is the, the taking and confining and then the facilitate. The, the other yeah. subsection. Yeah, I have not seen anything yet on this. Um, but once again, I'd argue that it's uh, distinguishable based upon the reasons that I've already stated, that to facilitate is a common mens rea to both of those options within the means. Now, as to the straight up sufficiency argument, um, we've already addressed two of the state's theories um, that he confined and then he dragged her out um, of the apartment. Those were two of the act, underlying acts upon which the state based its argument that the jury could convict of aggravated battery. The third one was that when the defendant, when Mr. Ellie dragged um, WH from the bedroom to the living room, that itself could constitute taking um, for the aggravated kidnapping um, conviction. The problem with that is, is there wasn't evidence to support any assertion that Mr. Ellie took, Ms., took WH from the bedroom to the living room. The only even hint of it is um, Brandon Clark's testimony. However, when he was pressed further, he admitted that he never saw either Mr. Ellie or WH in the bedroom and that when he was at the door, both of them were already in the living room. WH's testimony indicated the only time she was ever in that bedroom is when she walked through it to go to the bathroom. So there was no evidence presented at trial that um, Mr. Ellie took Miss took WH from the bedroom to the living room. So there would be no, there wouldn't be sufficient evidence. Um, what about the carrying of her from the apartment to go outside down the steps wherever he was gonna go with her at that point? Um, that, that would, we, we would agree that that is a forceful taking. What we would argue is that there was no evidence that he did that with the intent to terrorize. It goes back to Yes, there may have been evidence that he did that with the intent to inflict further bodily harm because there was evidence that he did inflict further bodily harm. But without, without something else indicating that he intended to terrorize her despite her subjective fear, we would argue that the state did not present evidence that Mr. Mr. Ellie took WH at that time to hold her with the intent to terrorize. So under any of the three theories in which the state um, told the jury that it could base its conviction upon, there was insufficient evidence. And unless the court has further questions, I would submit the other issues on the brief. Well, yeah, I've got another question. Yeah, absolutely. On the, on the issue, the, the victim testified at the preliminary hearing, correct? Yes. And was there any difficulty in getting the victim to the preliminary hearing for her testimony? Um, and my understanding, well, let me, let me just specify some, clarify some facts here. The preliminary hearing in this case was separated into three hearings. My uh, understanding- Why was that? Um, I believe after the, at the first hearing, they either ran out of time or a specific witness wasn't there. I don't remember which one it was. So they continued it and Miss, Miss, or, Sorry, WH was ordered to appear at that second preliminary hearing date, which I believe was February 15th. She didn't appear. Okay. Um, she was ordered by the court to appear. She did not appear. She did not appear. Okay. They went ahead and did, took the testimony of the witnesses who were there, 
but then continued the preliminary hearing, um, put out a material witness bond on the complaining witness, continued it for a third day, and she did actually appear at that hearing and finished her testimony. So she was under bond. She had to be under bond, which is very unusual. Yes. In order to compel her testimony against her ex-boyfriend, I yes. presume, who was the defendant. Yes. All right, so then we have this period of time, and we're ready for trial. And my question is, I don't see anywhere in your brief where you don't make the point that the state had her under, under subpoena, under an order of a material witness bond, and they apparently didn't continue that or they didn't uh, have a, have a sub subpoena or hold her in jail or anything, and all of a sudden she can't appear for trial. I, I do believe I did make the um, comparison to the Plunkett case where um, the Supreme Court found that because it was, it was a situation where the defense wanted to admit uh, witnesses' testimony from the first trial at a second trial. And the Supreme Court said that because they didn't maintain contact with the witness between the two trials, that wasn't sufficient to show due diligence. And I made the comparison with this case. And in this case, there's even more because... Um, Rodney Blue, who was also at, at the scene the night all of this happened, he was charged with crimes related to it. Miss or WH was subpoenaed to testify at the trial against him. And while that trial didn't go forward, she didn't show up at that trial. And that trial was in July. The state didn't even <coughs> attempt to subpoena WH for Mr. Ellie's trial until January 2nd, when the trial in this case was to start on January 28th. So it was less than a month before they even subpoenaed her, and there's no evidence that they attempted to find her before that date of the and, subpoena or that they kept in contact with and her. And the importance of this from your point of view is that because she didn't show up, the defendant had the evidence from her preliminary hearing brought in, yes. and that was used by the state because the state had to show that she was unavailable. Yes. And we have the, the issue of, of his rights of cross-examination and things of that nature. Yes. So it's pretty important. She was a it, critical witness. She, she was definitely a critical witness, particularly because she was the only witness who testified that Mr. Ellie ever put his fingers inside of her, which is what supported the rape charge. The only evidence of the rape came from Miss Ellie, um, from WH's testimony, because both of the other witnesses or persons who were there, Mr. Clark and Mr. Blue, both testified that they never saw that. Um, so at least for the purposes of the rape charge, it is highly unlikely that a jury would have convicted of rape had her testimony not been admitted. And we would argue that the state, because they knew she was such a difficult, that they should have known that they would have a difficult time procuring her presence because of her failure to appear at a preliminary hearing, her failure to appear at a co-defendant's trial. Subpoenaing her less than a week or less than a month prior to trial, despite actions that they took after issuing that subpoena to attempt to find her, waiting so long to subpoena her, not staying in contact throughout that time, knowing she was going to be so difficult, shows a lack of due diligence and her preliminary hearing testimony should not have been allowed to be read to the jury in lieu of her live testimony. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, the state appears by Stephen Obermeyer. And I'll address the same, or the first issue in the first order, and then answer uh, questions on the second issue as well. Uh, with regard to the first issue, uh, we, we disagree on what the, the remedy is, so I'd just like to talk about that briefly, and that I uh, see this as an issue involving uh, jury instruction, assuming they're right, jury instruction error, uh, as it was in State versus Timley when there is an issue. Uh, I don't think there is any Kansas Supreme Court case that says if you have sufficient evidence of one alternative means but not another, the remedy is acquittal. I don't think that there's a case that says that. Um, I would cite the court or direct the court to Justice Moritz's or Judge Moritz's now concurring opinion in State versus Brown where she talks about harmless error uh, of trial, uh, if it's a trial error for alternative means. 
And I think uh, Chief Judge Malone in State versus Shaw, you had a concurring opinion on that, on that point. So that's why I think we have this basic disagreement over what the, the remedy is. Uh, it's the state's hope that you don't get to the remedy uh, because State versus Haberline uh, is pretty clear that the alternative means are your different subsections of the kidnapping or aggravated kidnapping statute. And uh, uh, subsection three is to inflict bodily injury or to terrorize, that you don't need both of those. That's an option within a means. And uh, so that's why uh, we don't need to present evidence of terrorizing. However, at the uh, motion for judgment of acquittal, uh, District Judge Sarah Welch found that there was evidence of terrorizing. And if the court might recall, uh, uh, the defendant was going to drag WH out of the apartment. Uh, he had thrown, he ripped her clothes off of her, thrown her clothes over the balcony, and then he's dragging her outside. Next. Uh, her handprint, her bloody handprint, is on the wallboard next to the door because she does not want to go outside because uh, she thought that she was going to be thrown over the balcony. Now, whether that's her subjective intent or whether that was a communicated threat when the defendant threw her clothes over the uh, balcony, uh, I think that would be a, a question of a fact. But uh, Judge Welch thought that was sufficient evidence of terrorizing uh, uh, a communicated threat. And a communicated threat does not need to be verbal. Uh, there's a case uh, that I think it involves a, uh, putting a burning cross on somebody's yard in Kansas. It's a six can up second. I don't, can't think of the name. That says you don't, need to have, you don't need to have a statement. You can have a communicated in, uh, threat, and it doesn't need to be verbal. Have and you ever heard the sound of a pump shotgun when it's jacked in? That would be another uh, example of a communicated I threat. I think I once wrote an opinion that said that seems like a threat to me. Yes. But if you ever hear that and that gun's pointed at you. Right. But the question that I have here is there's much more than this. It, when you get kicked twice, when you get hit, you get your clothes taken off, you're called names, you're dragged outside, isn't all of that terrorizing? It's certainly a communicated intent to, to, uh, to threaten and, and harm. So yes, I, I think that would be terrorizing, all the things that he did uh, to her. In addition to the infliction of, uh, of bodily harm. Uh, our initial argument was under, under uh, State versus Haberline and Brown that you don't need to have both inflicting bodily injury and terrorizing the victim, but there is uh, sufficient uh, evidence uh, uh, to support that. And uh, as far as the, the three claims made in the, in the brief of appellant, the dragging from the bedroom, uh, Ellie's best friend, his name was Clark, uh, looked in the window and saw, uh, he got up the stairs to the apartment and saw Ellie pulling WH from the bedroom of the apartment to the living room. Uh, that's at volume 32, page 123. He was pulling her backwards with both arms under her underarms. And um, Blue, the person who owns the apartment, had... Uh, when he left the apartment, he testified that WH had gotten up to go to the bathroom, which was in his bedroom. So, and, he, and Blue goes outside, and uh, Ellie's there, and immediately goes upstairs. So that would uh, be circumstantial evidence that there was pulling from the bedroom. Uh, the second claim, as far as uh, closing the uh, door of the apartment, uh, Ellie came to the, the front door of Blue's apartment. He, he drags WH into the front room, uh, hits her, uh, the door's open, he goes and shuts the door. Uh, I don't know how cold it was that night, but it's not his apartment and he didn't do it to keep the draft out. He did it to keep Clark and Blue out so that he could uh, wail on the victim, which he proceeded to do. To do. And is when- that, Is that when he locked it? Yes, he, he went over and shut the door and he, and he locked it. And so it would take somebody with the key, and the testimony varies on this, um, there were two different versions. One version was uh, Blue unlocked the door because it's his apartment. Another version was that Ellie later, uh, after five or six minutes of wailing uh, on the victim, unlocked the, uh, the door to the apartment. It just seems to me that, that uh, with regard to your charging, you did not charge that the taking or confining was done to, with the intent to 
facilitate a commission of a crime. To me, the, the locking of the door was to facilitate the crime of uh, uh, beating uh, the woman, as well as the taking her outside down the steps where he beat her again on the ground once they got apparently scared by a neighbor or something. Uh, that would be also to the taking my, I think we're maybe heading for a car to facilitate some more beating of her away from the apartment. But you didn't charge any of that. You, you, you're going, if, if we agree that it, this is an alternative means situation, all these actions would have to be taken to terrorize the person, which um, doesn't seem to me as strong an intent as the commission of any crime, as far as the evidence in this case. As far as the uh, charging uh, decision, Judge Boozer, I, I, I don't re recall. I, pro I don't know. I don't think there's anything in the record as to how how we charged it the way we did. Uh, if you charge to facilitate, as far as the instruction, you didn't. Right, but the complaint only alleged that it was to inflict bodily injury or to terrorize the victim. I guess. We we would have had to amend the complaint or something to get that jury instruction. But, but uh, even under the subsection three, uh, if, if the taking or confinement was to inflict bodily injury, uh, uh, which is probably less than committing a crime, some other crime. That I'm I, with you on that. It's the ter terrorizing the victim. I'm sorry? The, the terrorizing the victim. I understand how the taking and or confining was done to inflict bodily injury, okay. which I, which in, if you had charged it under subsection two, would have been to facilitate the commission of the crime, which is beating her up, and and having the sexual relations. It just seems to me that terrorizing is is uh, a little vague, given all the other possibilities you had to charge, with regard to commission of the crime. I, I, I would say if uh, the court thinks that within this subsection of the kidnapping statute that you have to have inflicting bodily injury and terrorizing the crime, uh, which this would be the first case uh, that would say it's an alternative means within a subsection that I'm aware of, uh, that there still is uh, sufficient evidence of, of the terrorizing of WH, uh, who was sound asleep or passed out or something when, when uh, uh, she's awakened by punches from uh, Ellie, and and then all the things that happens to her for the five to seven minutes that uh, she's getting. Could you address um, that second issue? Yes. Uh, with regard to uh, the your the court's questions, uh, there was a material witness bond uh, on W H. Uh, it was a, I believe it was a, P, a PR bond, and she appeared at the first preliminary hearing setting. It got bifurcated. Uh, it was a PR bond? I think it was a PR bond. Personal recognizance? Yes. So if she doesn't show up for the next court appearance, she doesn't have to pay any money because she didn't require a bond. It, it would, she would have to pay it personally as opposed to a bondsman, I guess, but she would be re responsible for that. But. But uh, as far as efforts to look for her. Uh, but did that continue past the preliminary hearing? She, she did not show up at the second preliminary hearing setting, and then she showed up at the third preliminary hearing setting and testified. I, 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 think, I don't think it continued past that. Uh, okay, but, and, and that's my question, because as we okay. all know, at the conclusion of that preliminary hearing, the defendant is going to be bound over for trial, probably. Right. So there will be another court hearing and then other court hearings. Why in the world, when she was failing to appear earlier, and you know we've got an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend situation, and we all know how those turn out later on in the criminal justice system, everybody falls back in love with each other, why not continue that a witness material witness bond and order her to appear at the arraignment and then down for the next hearing until you get to the trial? If if our trial judge were Judge Michael Boozer, maybe that would have happened, but the issue is whether or not Judge Sarah Welch abused her discretion and nobody would agree with her in finding due diligence. And, and, and I guess it was terminated because she had a young child, and are you gonna keep her in custody from the prelim date in March 
of 2012 until the trial date of February 2013 you to make sure she appears? You wouldn't have to necessarily keep her in custody, but you would continue her bond and require her to appear so that when she doesn't, when the arraignment shows up, which is two or three or four months before trial and she doesn't appear, that gives you a heads up to start looking for her for four months rather than waiting for 30 days before trial before you say, hey, I wonder if she's going to show up. Let's start looking for her then. Right. That w I guess my, my heads up would, would give me a comfort level once she's on probation for uh, whatever uh, misdemeanor crime she was granted probation on uh, that summer. And uh, she failed to, so she's reporting to a probation officer. She has involvement with SRS. She's uh, got a young child. Uh, there, there are ways to contact her. And so she was on probation during this time period? Yes. And, and it wasn't until November that uh, there was a bench warrant issued for her arrest on a, on a probation violation issue. And then in, no, in late November or early December of 2012, Detective Rick Parsons testified that he started looking for her. So this wasn't just three or four weeks out. He's looking for her in late November, early December of 2012. And that's the trial in, is when? It's in uh, February, uh, late January. I think it's in late January of uh, 2013 that, that he's uh, looking for her. And uh, that's in volume 35, pages three to four. But, but so, and they were at a, uh, at a, executing a search warrant at a place where she had lived and she wasn't there. They check with SRS, she's not there. They check uh, all their criminal databases, the regional justice information database. Uh, they check with SRS. They check with the sheriff's office who has an active warrant out for her and is trying to look for her. Uh, there's also Accurant, uh, where they were trying to locate her that way. Uh, and I, I think uh, a reasonable person would agree with Judge Welch in finding that the state made efforts at, at due diligence. It's maybe not be perfect diligence, I guess, but uh, I don't know what else you could do to find somebody who's on probation uh, when you start looking for them two months uh, in advance. And uh, the defendant was offered a chance to continue the case uh, so the state could continue looking for WH in late January for that trial setting, and uh, he did not want to, uh, to do that. Um, why, why would the defendant want to continue the case when he knows that the critical witness that's going to incriminate him is on the lam? So, right. So his attorney can argue, where's the victim? Why isn't she here? She doesn't care. So find him not guilty. Um, it's probably to his benefit that she's not uh, not present for that. Uh, and, and, he, and there was a discussion before closing argument at the instruction conference as to what defense counsel could argue about uh, WH's uh, absence uh, in, in that case. So uh, for those reasons, um, uh, a reasonable person would agree with Judge Welch in, in determining um, the victim was unavailable and that there was due due diligence. Uh, I think that was all I uh, had to say. I would point out that the, the tr jury trial did start on January 28th of, of 2013, so it was late January and it was a four-day trial or so. Unless the court have, has any questions, I would uh, ask you to affirm his convictions. Thank you. There are just two points that I want to address um, and clarify. Um, first of all, with the dragging um, WH out, throwing her clothes over the balcony, we, we don't disagree that WH was likely terri terrified by that, likely herself terrorized. But unless the state presented evidence that the defendant did that with the intent to terrorize her, they didn't present sufficient evidence. Even if they, he did drag her out with the intent to throw her over the balcony, that's still dragging her out, taking her with the intent to inflict bodily harm, not with the intent to terrorize. Um, secondly, in regards to the second issue, I would argue that the fact that she had a probation violation warrant in late November and the state still didn't decide to issue a subpoena at that point when it should have known that she was gonna be even harder to locate because she wasn't uh, reporting to her probation officer. They still didn't issue a subpoena and put all of their weight behind looking for her adds to 
Do you think they'd be able to find her, to give her a subpoena when they couldn't find her and arrest her uh, uh, when she failed to report? Maybe not, but the issue goes to due diligence and whether or not they acted with due diligence and attempting to get her there. And we would argue that they didn't act with due diligence because they, they knew that, first of all, they knew that she was going to be difficult from the preliminary hearing. They knew she was going to be difficult in July when she didn't um, show up to Rodney Blue, Blue's trial. And I, I'm not entirely sure when it was she was placed on probation, so I don't know if I, I can't really make the argument that her being on probation, rebut the argument that her being on probation made it, gave the state some sort of confidence that she would be there. But she didn't show up at Rodney Blue's trial. They, she apparently um, violated her probation sometime in November. And at that point, the state would know that she would know that if she is arrested or stopped, her, her problem is not going to be testifying against her ex-boyfriend. Her problem is going to be she's going to go to jail or have the possibility that her probation is going to be revoked. So there's an even greater chance, a greater reason for her to stay away, to be, to be away so that she doesn't get arrested uh, either for the probation violation or to testify at trial. Right. Right. Um, so once they found that out, it, it was even more imperative that they try to get another material witness bond. So she's facing a not only a potential uh, jail term or prison sentence, depending upon her her underlying crime, but also a, at least the first material witness bond was ten thousand dollars, a pretty hefty financial incentive to make herself known as well, to make her whereabouts known. But they still waited until January second to even issue the subpoena. And just another point that I think bears mentioning is the hearing on this date to declare her unavailable was January 18th. At that time, the district court didn't relieve the state of its obligation to continue to locate her, but on the first day of trial, the state rested on its arguments from the hearing 10 days before. It didn't indicate that it had continued looking for her. And we would argue, and, but this district court still found that it had exercised due diligence. We would argue that the state's lack of keeping in contact with her from the preliminary hearing and then failing to even attempt to subpoena her until January 2nd and not providing any evidence of further actions it took from J January 18th to January 28th to continue to locate her indicates that no reasonable judge would, would decide that the state had actually exercised due diligence in securing this critical witness for trial and would ask that Mr. Um, Ellie's convictions be reversed. Thank you, counsel, for your briefs and your arguments. We'll move on to the second case on this afternoon's docket. Taking a break from criminal matters, the next case is going to be a civil case. I believe it is designated for 20-minute argument per side. This is a case from Johnson County. Uh, it's 111-521. It's entitled Heartland Apartment Association versus the City of Mission, Kansas. And again, for the benefit of the audience, I'll give a brief summary of the facts of this case and the issues. Uh, the City of Mission adopted a transportation utility fee ordinance, often called a TUF ordinance, to raise funds for street maintenance. Uh, the TUF is paid by all owners of developed property within the city unless exempted. The amount assessed is based on the direct and indirect use or benefit each developed property owner derives from the use of the city's public thoroughfares generated by the developed property. Heartland Apartment Association and other property owners filed a lawsuit seeking to declare the ordinance uh, in violation of state statutory and constitutional law to enjoin enforcement of the ordinance and to recover the amounts that had been paid. On cross motions for summary judgment, the district court found that the TUF was a tax 
However, the district court found that it was not an excise tax prohibited under KSA 12-494. Uh, so the district court upheld the TUF. Uh, Heartland raises several issues on this appeal uh, and the city cross appeals challenging the district court's ruling that the TUF is a tax. So there's many issues in this case. The primary issues are, uh, is the TUF a tax or is it a fee? And the second issue is that if it is a tax, uh, is it a, an excise tax uh, in violation of KSA 12-194? So with that background, I'll ask for appearance of counsel. You can come forward. Who do we have here for the appellant? Your Honor, Mary Jo Shaney here on behalf of the appellants. Uh, in this case, the plaintiffs below, I'd like to, the court to know I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Jim Bowers and Daniel Goldberg. All right. And for the appellee? Your Honor, the athlete and cross appellant appears by Thomas Lee Murray and Mark A. Sampson of Lakewood Engage. And I represent the Army. Ms. Shaney, whenever you're ready. Do you wish to reserve any rebuttal time? Your Honor, I do wish to reserve seven minutes of the 20 minutes as rebuttal time. Okay. May it please the court. We are here today because the city of Mission, Kansas, passed what it calls a fee, the transportation utility fee, uh, which in reality is an illegal excise tax. Now the trial court properly concluded that the so-called fee was a tax, but the trial court erred when it determined that it was a legal tax. The broad questions break out, Your Honors, for this court in, in, in two general ways. First, one general question is, is it an excise tax under KSA 12-194? The second broad question is, did the appellants, were the appellants provided sufficient process when the city enacted this so-called fee, and were the appellants treated equally or fairly, are they being treated equally or fairly, under the tough tax as it presently exists? I will try to address those general questions in four ways. Number now, one. Let me interrupt you first, counsel. Isn't it more accurate to say that is it an excise tax or in the nature of an excise tax? Because as I read the statute, it says the city cannot impose an excise tax or a tax in the nature of an excise tax. I'm sure you're going to enlighten us on what that means, I am, but isn't Honor. that more accurate? It is more accurate. That's exactly what the statute says. KSA-12194 is a pro prohibition against excise taxes or, the, or taxes in the nature of an excise. The scheme of things in Kansas for municipal governments they can enact taxes that the legislature says they can, or they cannot enact taxes that the legislature prohibits. Which is it? Do you understand my question? Uh, I, I do In other understand. words, do they, do, does a municipal government have a right to impose any tax at once unless it's prohibited by the state, or they can only enact taxes that the state allows them to enact? Which is it? Let me go to the, it, it, a city can enact only those taxes that are not prohibited by the Kansas legislature. The core feature in this case is, was the tough tax enacted in violation of 12194, which prohibits, with very few exceptions, none of which apply to the city, None of that is in dispute. The city did not try to engage the only exceptions that would have allowed it to pass the tax. And I will return to that, Your Honor. Before I do, I want to address just a couple of things. First of all, a 
number one. The facts, very briefly, I know your honors are familiar with them, but there are a couple I want to focus on. Number two, I want to focus on the tax fee distinction under the executive aircraft case as it was interpreted properly and correctly and thoughtfully by the trial judge in this case. Number three, I want to talk about why the tough tax is an excise in violation of KSA 12194, which significantly in 2006 was amended, and that amendment eliminated, eliminated any suggestion that there is a limitation on the broad prohibition under 12194. Finally, I would like to address very quickly as my fourth point why the trial court erred in rejecting the claims of due process and equal protection. A couple of points, number one, on the facts. Just want to highlight. Before you get to that, yes, sir. isn't it important to note our standard of review? How are we supposed to look at this? And I just want to see if you agree with the executive aircraft where it says, in examining a statute within the context of the Home Rule Amendment, the or an, an ordinance would be presumed to be valid unless its infringement upon the tax statute, quote, is clear beyond substantial doubt. Is that our standard of review? Is that how we're supposed to look at this ordinance? That is part of your honor's standard of review, and I don't disagree with it. There are additional presumptions and statutory construction rules that are at work in this, in this particular case, and they each have to be addressed. I'm not suggesting that there's a formal way that the human mind goes through these presumptions any more than you would at a regular trial when the burden shifts from one party to another. Those presumptions include, Your Honor, that tax statutes, and the tax statute at issue in this case is not the city ordinance. We don't read KSA 12194 as if we had to give the city every benefit of the doubt. We don't. In fact, it's just the opposite. 12194 is a taxing statute and must be strictly construed. And the court, so that's one presumption. Part of what I will argue that the court needs to do in this case is examine against the backdrop of the Callaway case but looking at the presently existing language of 12 KSA uh, 194, what excise actually means. And what Callaway says, and what Executive says, and what Home Builder says, and what the Renaissance Festival case says, is that when you are trying to interpret what a statute means, and Callaway in particular was honed in on this, you have to look at what the legislative intent was. And I'll skip to that right now. Um, part of why we argue, Your Honor, that appellants contend that the tough tax, I call it a tough tax because the trial court declared it a tax. I realize we're in dispute about that. The tough tax is an excise or in the nature of an excise. And by the way, the Attorney General of the State of Kansas also determined that the tough tax was an illegal excise tax. Is that binding on us? It's not binding on, on, on your honors, no. It does reflect, of course, what the Attorney General views as the legislature's policy on tax matters. But no, it is not binding. It's a guiding Force. That opinion addressed this particular uh, enactment, did it not? It did, Your Honor. But the city chose not to follow his advice. The city chose not to follow its advice, and, and, and I want to come back to Excise. One of the things that the city also chose to do when it was challenged by several churches who sued the city in 2011 over this tax claiming, among other things, it was an illegal excise tax. Well, as the, uh, the appellants do here, well, in that case, the city settled the case. They gave the, the tax fee money back to the churches, and they did one more significant thing. They amended their tough statute legislation to allow, under Kansas's tax exemption statute, to allow the churches and other not-for-profits to be exempt from the so-called fee. 
Doesn't that necessarily mean it's a tax? Isn't that a concession on the part of the city that it's a tax? Because <clears throat> churches can pay fees if you want to. I mean, it, it seems to me that when the city did that, that means they conceded this is a tax. Your Honor, if we had heard that before we filed the lawsuit, no one would have to be here. But I do believe it, they wouldn't admit that, but if you look the thing square in the eye and look at what it says and what it does, and you're using a tax exemption statute, it sure as heck begins to look more and more like a tax. Well, it's not a fee exemption statute, is it? It's not. Was the city's conduct with regard to the churches in mission, was that made a part of this record? It was, Your Honor. Um, all of those, the, the, the petition that was filed by the churches is part of the underlying record. The settlement agreement itself is part of the uh, underlying record. We even have some admissions that were filed by the city's then attorney as part of the underlying record. And to go back, um, Your Honor, to your point about uh, uh, churches aren't exempt from, from other types of fees, that is exactly so. And one of the issues that we grappled with in this case was that the city contended, and it says this in the tough legislation itself, contended that this tax was modeled on the stormwater ordinance. Well, a couple of problems with that. Number one, the stormwater ordinance is an ordinance that the city could charter out of, number one. The city didn't do that in this case. Number two, the stormwater fee, unlike the tough tax, does apply to churches and not-for-profits. So in that way, part of what the appellants argued is that you're not treating all owners of developed proper property equally or in the same way. I'd like to go back for a moment to the excise tax and its definition um, because we do contend that the trial court erred in finding that it wasn't an excise tax. The Callaway case fully supports the appellant's position here, and here is why. Callaway does a couple of things. Number one, it defines what excise is. Number two, Callaway directs us to look at the actual legislative language to determine what the legislature meant so you can figure out under 12194 what excise means. Here's what Callaway said about what an excise is. That court stated that the term excise has come to mean and include practically any tax which is not an ad valorem tax. An excise tax is a tax imposed upon the performance of an act, engaging in an occupation, the enjoyment of a privilege. It is a general term covering the entire field. Significantly, Callaway doesn't leave it there although that's somewhat where the trial court left it. Callaway says now, we've got to go look at the language. And Callaway is 1973 case. The taxing statute that was actually at issue was called the tax, shorthanded, the tax lid law. And the actual statutory number was 794424, I believe. That is the predecessor law to KSA 12194. So, Callaway is looking to find out, is it an excise tax that these uh, business owners are challenging or isn't it? Here's what I got to do. I got to see what the statute says. What the statute said in 1973 is not what the statute says now. Here's what it said then, though. Quote, no city shall impose an excise tax or tax in the nature of an excise upon a sale or transfer of personal or real property or the use thereof or the rendering of a service. In Callaway, that language was read as a limitation. Now, right or wrongly, it was read as a limitation. That's what that court decided in that moment in time. But that language was read as a limitation as to what excise could possibly mean at that point in time. And the Callaway court said, that tells us the legislature intended to narrow the scope, perhaps, of that broad definition of excise um, in order to give meaning to the word excise. So if we were dealing with a 1973 statute, would uh, 
there be an excise tax? Would the tough be an excise tax? Well, under the Callaway uh, uh, analysis, it might not be. Because um, here's what Callaway, here's, here's what Callaway did. So it's the, it's, you're saying that since the change was to delete this language upon a sale or transfer of personal or real property or the use thereof or the rendering of a service, since that's been dropped, now we know that this, that the tough is an excise tax. Y yes, and I, 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 well, that's part of the argument, right. Your Honor, because in 2006, when the 12194 legislation, 12194 was amended, that language, sale and transfer, real or personal property and service, was taken out. And what Callaway says to us uh, is that historical background and changes made in a statute must be considered in determining legislative intent for the purpose of statutory construction and for the purpose of determining what the meaning of excise is. So the limitation, rightly or wrongly construed by the Callaway Court in the former tax lid law, now 12194, no longer applies. The only the only excise taxes allowed are those expressly set forth in the statute itself. And there are four or five exceptions. We laid them out in our brief. The city doesn't claim that there are any of those. So what this discloses, this change in the legislation, whatever the tax lid law meant previously, this discloses the, can the intent of the Kansas legislature to broadly define and prohibit excise taxes. In concluding that the city of Mission's tax was not an excise, the trial court erred in three significant ways. Number one, the trial court focused on the word practically in the Callaway case um, and lost sight of or, or perhaps ignored the actual language of 12194, which as I've already talked about, was amended in 2006. Number two, the trial court failed to interpret the language, a tax, an excise tax, or in the nature of an excise tax. Now I realize what our judge did was, I mean, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I've already determined it's not an excise and therefore it cannot be in the nature of an excise. Well, I would respectfully suggest that in, in um, a, a sort of plain reading of the phrase in the nature, you're talking about something that might be similar to or have characteristics like or function in a way like. Um, maybe, those three, maybe those words are just surplusage and we can ignore them. Maybe the prohibition is only excise taxes, and we don't know why they put or in the nature of excise taxes. Uh, maybe we can ignore them. Is I that think what they, the judge did? Well, I, I don't know if that's what he did for certain. It seems as if that language didn't matter. He, he did make a comment about it. He, he said, it doesn't mean anything more than what I've already told you excise is. But... Kansas law and Kansas cases and Kansas rules of construction would direct us that you can't not read the language in a statute. You have to assume the legislature put it there for a reason and not as surplus. You'd agree with me that in the nature of an excise tax means in the character, having characteristics yes. of an excise tax. Yes. Right, okay. I bet your law firm has a few copies of Black's Law Dictionary. We do, Your Honor, and yes. I know the judge cited it in this case. He cited it in this case, and it's the Bible for lawyers everywhere, right? <laughs> no. The answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Black's Kansas law Supreme Court is, but... Yes. Judge Vano said, Black's Law Dictionary defines an excise tax as, quote, a tax imposed on the manufacture, sale, or use of goods, parentheses, such as a cigarette tax, close parentheses, or an occupation or activity, parentheses, such as a license tax or an attorney occupation fee. Now, I understand the characteristics of that, and we've got a Kansas case, I think, that uh, the mission points out, where the, a city, I think it was Bonner, 
was taxing admission to the uh, uh, Renaissance Festival. It's a, a ticket, it, it's a tax that you put on for, for doing an activity, something, or a job, or employment. And it's typically transactional based on each individual uh, element. Now explain to me how a tax on all the good people in the city of Mission who have either residential or commercial property because they have, and they have traffic, they abut streets, and they're being taxed on that, explain to me how that's anything characteristic of what an excise tax is described as in Black's Law Dictionary. The excise tax uh, definition in Black's Law Dictionary doesn't do justice to the excise tax definition given in the Callaway case. The excise tax definition in Black's Dictionary doesn't take into account that in 2006, any reading of that statute that required allegedly some transactional element is gone. In your reading of Callaway, is it your argument that when the court says engaging in an occupation or the enjoyment of a privilege, you're saying that it is a privilege to own property. In exercising your privilege of owning improved property and mission, you pay a, this tough tax. Is that your argument? That is our argument, Your Honor, and that's the third basis on which I was going to uh, uh, tell the court, advise the court, that the trial court erred. The trial court erred in concluding that the tough taxed no privilege because here's what happens in the city of Mission. You cannot own developed property in Mission without being taxed. Is there, I have to ask, because I've wondered when I first read this case, is there unimproved property in Mission? <laughs> that may be the, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor, but in theory, there's a little, uh, there's a little provision in the tough tax that, that carves out a tiny something for so-called undeveloped property. It's treated slightly differently. They don't pay the $72 a year That's for, right. for a one house. Or Although if they have a shed on or a garage, it's developed. So, Your Honor, back to your point then. I need to interrupt, and you're getting into your rebuttal time at this point. All right, Your Honor. I will uh, um, refer the court to our, our, our briefs and then respond accordingly on rebuttal. May it please the court. The reason that the Kansas legislature does not want municipalities enacting ordinances under home rule that might be excises is that there are certain things that the state legislature wants the state to occupy the field on. For example, the state of Kansas doesn't want the city of Mission, the city of Overland Park, the city of Topeka, the city of Wichita to license doctors. It doesn't want those cities to license lawyers. It doesn't want those cities issuing duck stamps. It doesn't want the cities uh, issuing fishing licenses. If somebody in Wichita were lucky enough to find oil on his or her land, the legislature certainly doesn't want the city of Wichita enacting a severance tax on that person's oil. That's why the language is in there. Conversely, what we have here is a quintessentially local function. It's exactly what home rule is all about. The city of Mission in August of 2010 passed a transportation utility fee, which has functioned very smoothly since then and has been of great assistance to the city it's in paying an, for roadways. It's not an ad valorem. It's a property tax, isn't it? It, it is not an ad valorem tax. It's certainly not an ad valorem tax. Right. And Although, as I read the big, thick book, if you've got a shopping center, you're going to be paying a lot more than a one-family dwelling of $72 a year. You bet. Uh, the the single-family dwellings have a flat fee, uh, and, of course, this whole litigation is motivated by people who own big shopping centers, so that's understandable. Um, but as a segue to, to what you're saying, Judge Hill, when you consider 
the exigencies of this and, and you try to get into what is an excise or in the nature of an excise, there are certain things that clearly are. And in fact, uh, in its brief, the Attorney General lays out quite a number of activities that are. And I think it's important to look at this. This is at page nine of the Attorney General's brief. It says, over the years, excises have been imposed in a myriad of forms, including taxes on commodities such as whiskey, legacy taxes, stamp taxes on legal documents, taxes on amusements, telephone and telegraph messages, express and freight receipts, issuance and transfer of securities, insurance policies, patent medicines, income taxes, club dues, gasoline and fuels, air transportation and telecommunication, and taxes on certain activities of pension plans, exempt organizations, and health plans. Obviously, the legislature would not want any city in Kansas enacting an ordinance that would attempt to, to impose a tax or a fee on any of those kinds of activities. And that's what this language means. In other words, when you're talking about the performance of an act or the engaging in an occupation or uh, enjoying a privilege, it is a voluntary act, quite clearly. And if, as Judge Vano did, you take the position that this is an involuntary enactment, it cannot be an excise, period. So no matter which version of the law you look at, uh, certainly the standard of review is precisely as articulated by Judge Boozer. Uh, this cannot possibly be an excise, and that's why Judge Vano ruled the way he did. It's confusing at first when you get into trying to parse out all the statutory language and look at the cases that have talked about it, but once you understand the big picture of what an excise is and why the legislature doesn't want certain municipalities enacting excises, it's really very simple. Council, I asked Ms. Shaney what the essence of her argument was concerning Callaway, and I'll ask you the same thing. <clears throat> An excise tax is, a, this is quoted from the Callaway, an excise tax is a tax imposed on the performance of an act, the engaging in an occupation, or the enjoyment of a privilege. And if I understand her argument, saying it is a tax upon my owning a piece of improved property in Mission, Kansas, why isn't that an excise tax? Why doesn't that fit under that? Well, Your Honor, because that's not at all the kind of privilege it's talking about. An excise is the voluntary obtaining of a special type of a privilege, not just owning a piece of real estate. That's also pointed out in one of these amicus briefs filed by an anti-tax organization. It, it's, it's a nonsensical argument. Uh, you, you can't say that simply because uh, you're uh, exercising your already granted right to own a home that you are now paying for a privilege of practicing law, let's say. It, it's a nonsensical argument. And Judge Vano certainly gave no, no shrift to it at all. But uh, in terms of whether this is or isn't an excise, if you find it's a tax and it's an involuntary charge, then it cannot be an excise because excises are all voluntary. Um, as to the idea that practically any tax that uh, is not an ad valorem tax is an excise, uh, part of the mischief that we got into here came with the Attorney General's opinion, which was obtained at the request of a state legislator, not, not at all an unusual thing. But uh, page five of the, of the Attorney General's opinion, in the last paragraph it says, it cannot be an ad valorem tax and instead must be an excise tax or a tax in the nature of an excise. Well, that completely skips the issue in the law exam uh, on the a theory that any tax that is not an ad valorem tax has to be an excise tax, and that's not what the law says. It says practically any tax. In the Von Ruden case, which we've cited, the court points out that an intangibles tax is neither uh, a, uh, an ad valorem tax or uh, an excise. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. So the attorney general's opinion is wrong. And we believe that the plaintiff's position is wrong and that Judge Vanna was correct. Now, we have- He's yes, only correct so far. 
you, because you've crossed the field too. Well, I, Your Honor, you read my mind. I'm, right. I'm starting right there. Uh, let me say a few words about the cross appeal so you understand why we did this. Um, there's a Colorado case that is more on point with these facts than anything I've ever seen in the 43 years I've practiced law. It's, it's just completely on all fours. Yes, it has been said by the Kansas Supreme Court that if an act is involuntary, uh, it has to be a tax, and we're well aware of that. I know that uh, it's difficult, uh, even in a case of first impression, which all parties agree this is, for any trial court to go out on a limb and, and do what we asked them to do. But appellate courts are not in the same situation. This is a case of first impression. Colorado and Kansas have often looked to each other for guidance on tax issues. And uh, this was modeled after that case to be a fee. And uh, if you look at stormwater fees, for example, which are perfectly legal, sewage disposal fees are legal, those are also involuntary, but they're totally legal. So as a matter of- exempted the churches from this because on the basis that it was a property tax, did you not? Your Honor, uh, pardon my saying this, I wasn't involved in that, but uh, well, when- Well, it seems like to me the city on one hand is saying- yeah. In, in settling this lawsuit with the churches, it's a property tax and it's exempt. But in dealing with these people, this is a fee and Judge Vino got it wrong. You, you see uh, my dilemma to, here? To the extent that you believe that conduct inconsistent, I can certainly understand that. I'm trying to point out only that in cross appealing, which to be very candid, I had a lot of soul searching about in this case, uh, our belief was that if it ever did get at the appellate level, and at your level, the Supreme Court level, we wanted that preserved so that somebody could look at it. The Colorado decision is very well reasoned. The executive aircraft case is 22 years old. It doesn't deal with anything akin to the fact situation we have here. And with stormwater fees being legal, sewage fees being legal, they're involuntary. Why can't an appellate court look at this and say the reasoning in Colorado makes total sense? Uh, it is a fee. It's not a tax. And, and that's a, a, a very legitimate position to set forth here. But I do acknowledge that if you find that because it's involuntary under current case law, that it would be a tax. It, it cannot simply under any circumstances be considered to be an excise tax. The reading that uh, owning property is a voluntary act that uh, uh, is some kind of a privilege, uh, is a very strained attempt to find something that isn't there. This is, and that's why Judge Vano's decision was so strong in this regard. Uh, this is a classic example of home rule properly utilized. And it is not uh, an ad valorem tax and it's not an excise tax. It is a charge, which we've denominated as a fee, our client has, and uh, uh, absolutely must be upheld uh, it's been going since 2010 and doing very well, despite multiple changes of uh, uh, the city commission. Let me ask Council. you this. Um, this has been challenged, <coughs> similar enactments have been challenged, what, in Washington? Your Honor, uh, it, yeah. there have been about six, and nowhere, uh, Idaho, Washington, Florida, uh, Texas, Oregon, in none of these cases has a similar kind of transportation utility fee been invalidated on the basis that it's an excise tax. They've all been They've other- They've been invalidated on that for other reasons. You got it. And, and now three have been validated. Uh, I believe it's Colorado, Texas, and Oregon have validated it. But the ones that weren't had nothing to do with an illegal excise. In fact, they found that it was not an illegal excise. So that's a unanimous holding in other states that it's not. It was Washington that said it was an illegal property tax, wasn't it? I don't recall, Your Honor. I know they, they did not. They did say it was an illegal excise. Nobody has held that this is an illegal excise, and and it's not here. The appellants have not addressed an issue that's raised in the brief concerning a motion to alter or amend. And I simply want to state for the record, since that's in their briefs, Your Honor, how am I doing on time? Still have nine minutes. Thank you. Uh, I simply want to state, so I don't waive the opportunity to put it forth, 
that after Judge Vano had made his ruling and had taken extraordinary means to make sure everyone had his or her chance to put everything in and uh, had ruled on cross motions for summary judgment, meaning there weren't any fact issues, the appellants filed uh, a paper called a motion to alter or amend the judgment in which they inserted an entirely new theory of recovery that had never ever been raised at all at any time in the case despite Judge Vano's uh, very open request to the parties to make sure they had everything in there that they wanted. Which, which argument is that? Uh, Your Honor, it relates to the idea that the ordinance uh, is invalid based on the manner in which it was adopted. And it's somewhat moot because if that were held true, it would just get readopted. But anyway, that, that argument was made. And uh, it was akin to filing a motion to amend a petition after you'd already gotten to the summary judgment stage. Judge Vano very correctly denied that. Uh, the case law is quite clear that a motion to amend, to alter or amend, cannot be used for that purpose, nor can any of those issues be considered on appeal. And I just wanted to emphasize that because even though it wasn't raised in the opening uh, argument, it is extensively discussed in the appellant's brief. Uh, we don't believe that it should be considered by the court at all. With that, I'm finished unless the court has any additional questions. Thank you. try to set a couple things straight. The argument from the city about an excise is voluntary and therefore it can't possibly be the privilege of owning property raises a false dichotomy. It sounds superficially like it might have meaning, but it in fact doesn't in this case. And here's why it's a false dichotomy. Every tax, excise, property, income, intangible, the taxes that we're actually familiar with in Kansas as opposed to a special fee tax from Colorado, all of those taxes, the payment is involuntary. And what you well, look at... I thought I understood the argument to mean if you have a tax on tobacco, for example, if a city, and I know it's not a good argument, you don't have to smoke. So if you don't have to buy the if you don't buy the tobacco, you don't have to pay the tax. And I think isn't that the nature of the, Mr. Murray's argument? I you don't have to be a, a lawyer, so you don't have to pay that. You don't have to be a barber, so you don't have to pay that. Yes. Yeah, so in that sense, you don't look at the forced payment. You look at what the act is you're undertaking in order to get the thing that you want: cigarettes, a good smoke, for example, uh, a nice cigar. Uh, a ticket admission to the Renaissance Festival. But in fact, it's, it's, it is a false dichotomy here because a tax payment is always involuntary, but you can choose to do some things over others. And in this case, what we have said is that the privilege, if you want to use the Callaway definition, one of the Callaway definitions of what an excise tax is, it's the privilege of owning developed property in the city of Mission. And, and, and that's very much, Your Honors, like the privilege of doing business in the state of Kansas, which the Kansas courts found many years ago in cases like Pacific, which are cited in the uh, city's brief and in our briefs at the trial level, that is a kind of privilege. That turned into one of the exceptions under 12, uh, 194, and that's the uh, license tax, the occupational license tax. That had to be legislated into 12, 194. Can uh, you give us any case anywhere in the United States since the beginning of time <laughs> where a court has held that a taxing scheme similar to this one is not an excise tax or is an excise tax? I, I, 
I can't tell you one where there it was called an excise tax, but let me say a couple of things about the Florida case that wasn't mentioned, the Washington case that was mentioned, there's an Idaho case as well, and then of course we have the Bloom case. And here is one of the ironies. So focusing, for example, on Port Orange, the Florida case, one of the reasons that the court in that case determined that their transportation utility fee was illegal is because it taxed owners and occupants just as, almost just as, the City of Missions does. The City of Mission doesn't tax occupants, by the way. It's only owners. What Port Orange found offensive in that is that, by gosh, that's a property tax. You can't try to get in here and support it by trying to claim to me it's an excise tax because in Port Orange, a very similar statute was determined unconstitutional because it taxed owners and they viewed that under their constitutions as a tax on ownership, illegal. That's why that tax was stuck, struck down. That's why excise didn't make one bit of difference. In the Covell case, which the city likes to cite in their favor, and the trial judge actually referenced in a footnote as being in accord with his decision, the Covell case is a little more complicated in Washington. What happened in that, first of all, in, in uh, uh, Seattle, in the Washington case, the city actually had the power to pass an excise tax. The city was angling to uh, 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 persuade the uh, Washington Supreme Court that it should be upheld as an excise tax. There again, what the court found was, you know, we'd, this looks a little bit to us like a property tax. Oh, but city of Seattle, since you included in this tax owners and occupants, occupants don't necessarily own property, we won't find it in violation of a property tax. The real uh, uh, harm in the Washington case was that there was very little relationship between what was the, the use uh, or the, the benefit to the users and how much they were charged. It was all out of joint. One of the things that happens when we try to go to these other states is that at some point, because constitutions are different, statutes are different, ordinances are different, you get so far afield from what Kansas law is, you end up eviscerating the very law we have here to help us understand. Do you want to speak to, uh, to Bloom versus Fort Collins? Yes. The, our neighboring state. Our neighboring state. Uh, and a beautiful state at that. All right. You're down to two minutes. But. All right, Your Honors. I'll, I'll answer um, uh, Judge Hill's question. Critically and correctly, the trial court in our case rejected the city's contention that Colorado law in the Bloom case should somehow displace Kansas law, and here's why, or here's partly why. In Kansas, a fee must be voluntary. In Colorado, it doesn't have to be. This is what our judge said, and he is right. In, in Kansas, actual use of a service is key in assessing a fee. In Colorado, it is not. In this case, the benefit of maintenance of the streets in yours to the public at large. So what happens under the tough fee is that only those who own developed property in Mission have this extra special burden that doesn't fall on the rest of us who can zoom into Mission and zoom out, presumably, and nobody has a toll road gate up. As to my, our other points, Your Honor, um, I, I said this in my opening remarks, but I would ask the court to uh, look at our briefs, which address the due process and equal protection arguments, and they also address the argument uh, raised in our motion to amend on a procedure under 12137. Given that the tough taxes every unfortunate mission resident who has developed property in the city, correct? I mean, it does that. Except for those that are tax exempt. Right, okay. Given that that's the character of that tax, would you agree with me that the tough is more characteristic 
of a property tax as opposed to, as you said, is an excise tax? It has characteristics that look very much like a property tax, except it was arranged and set up so that it wasn't based, as Kansas law would require, strictly on the value. So superficially, in any case, we put this in a footnote in one of our briefs. You know, there's only so far you can go in saying the thing that the city is presenting is not what it seems. But it does bear some resemblance to a property tax, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council, thank you very much for your briefs and your arguments. You each did an outstanding job on the case. Not a run-of-the-mill case, as you realize, so we'll take this matter under advisement and get a decision to you as soon as we can. You can, you can always clear the room, that's for sure. Must be a lot of mission people. All right, we do have one more case this afternoon, getting back to the criminal arena. Uh, this is a case from right here in Johnson County, uh, 110 943, entitled The State of Kansas versus James Lee Wilson. Uh, I will again uh, try to give a brief summary of the case. Uh, after burglarizing a rural property, James Lee Wilson attempted to elude sheriff's deputies in an extended car chase. After wrecking his own truck, Wilson stole a deputy patrol vehicle and hit the deputy as he fled the scene. Wilson swerved toward a second deputy as he tried to maneuver around stop sticks deployed across the roadway to try to get him to stop his vehicle. Wilson was ultimately convicted of numerous offenses, including battery of a law enforcement officer and aggravated assault of a law enforcement officer. There are three issues raised on appeal. Number one, did the state commit prosecutorial misconduct during closing argument by vouching for a witness and making inflammatory remarks about the defendant's case? Issue number two, was there sufficient evidence to support Wilson's conviction of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer? <clears throat> and then there is a final legal issue uh, did the district court err by classifying Wilson's 1988 attempted burglary conviction as a person felony for criminal history purposes in order to decide the length of the sentence? Uh, so with that explanation, we have returning counsel here, uh, Ms. Curls. Yes. But you're not on the brief in this case. I am case, not. Right? Um, my bar number is 22234. I got it this time. Are we sure she's an attorney? <laughs> <laughs> highly, highly suspicious. And then Mr. Minahan is here for the state of Kansas. So Ms. Curls, do you wish to reserve any time for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, three minutes. And once again, I'd like to um, focus my argument on the first issue of the brief, unless the court has questions on the others. And the first issue in this case is prosecutorial misconduct. And uh, as we know, prosecutorial misconduct has two steps to review. The first is whether or not the comments made by the prosecutor were outside the wide latitude given to a prosecutor in discussing the evidence. And the second is whether or not that misconduct constitutes plain error. 
Now, in this case, there were two different categories of claimed misconduct, um, one commenting on the credibility of witnesses, and the second was making inflammatory statements. And I'm going to start with the argument on the inflammatory statements. Um, the first uh, inflammatory statement that the prosecutor made both an open or prosecutors made both an opening and closing is essentially that Mr. Wilson went on a six and a half mile path of destruction. Um, and the reason that this was claimed to be um, inflammatory is because I, I, it, it oversold what actually happened. Um, and, there's, there's no doubt that there was actually, that there was some damage in this case. The first would be at where the burglaries occurred and there was a gate broken. Um, the second, uh, Mr. Wilson's truck caught on fire. Um, and then you could make a movie out of this, couldn't you? You, you could. <laughs> you could. It, it, it had a very Dukes of Hazard feeling to me as I was reading it. Um, his truck got on fire, so he got out, and then he ended up stealing, um, taking one of the deputies vehicles and the deputy said that he hit him as he was driving away so that would be a second damage that occurred and the third damage is when he was trying to avoid the stop sticks and he rolled that suburban and of course damaged the suburban so and, that, and that's not a six and a half mile path of this well um it, it may the entire Incident may have taken place over six and a half miles, but to say it's a six and a half mile path of destruction seems to indicate that it is more like a movie where there is destruction through that entire six and a half miles rather than three somewhat isolated incidences in which damage occurred. It's giving it more of a Bruce Willis type feel of constant destruction as opposed to three instances, which would be inflammatory against uh, Mr. Wilson's case. A tornado could make a swath of... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but this man being in a car could only do it a little bit. And, and he only... I mean, yes, he did cause damage. I mean, there's no denying that he caused damage. But the argument is that the, the prosecutors were trying to inflame the prejudices and the passions of the jury by calling it a six and a half mile path of destruction, when in reality there were three points in which damage actually occurred, even if those three points were spread out over six and a half miles. Um, the second inflammatory statement that was alleged was when the prosecutor, I'm going to get this directly from the brief so I make sure I get it right, um, prosecutor during closing argument stated, Mr. Wilson knows that if he submits and talks to Deputy Colmere, it's not going to be very long before Justin Colmere figures out that this guy with Wyandotte County plates acting suspiciously in Western Johnson County, there's no reason for him to be driving out in the county with a pickup truck loaded full of stuff so he bolts. And the reason this was claimed to be inflammatory to a Johnson County jury is there's really no other reason to indicate that the truck, that he was driving a Wyandotte County truck with Wyandotte County plates as a Wyandotte County resident, unless it was to be, to potentially prejudice a Johnson County jury against the defendant. Are you, are you really arguing that the mere mention of the word Wyandotte County in Johnson County is an inflammatory I, statement. I, I will admit I am from western Kansas and this argument would not have occurred to me. This brief was written by someone who grew up in Johnson County. Um, so apparently the <laughs> argument occurred to him. Um, and I, I mean, I mean there, there is a point, um, and he makes it in his brief, that there are different demographics within between Wyandotte County and Johnson County. There are I have enough friends from both counties to recognize that there seems to be some animosity between the two counties at times. And what, what was argued as what was inflammatory is the idea that there would be no legitimate reason from someone from a county over, from Wyandotte County, one county over, to be in Johnson County unless it was for some sort of, I guess, nefarious purpose. It's using, potentially using that potential Wyandotte County stigma to make that inference to a Johnson County jury. Was the defendant from Wyandotte County? Um, that's what I, 
I don't know for sure whether or not the defendant was from Wyandotte County. The prosecutor did seem to imply that he was from Wyandotte County because he was driving in Johnson County with a truck with Wyandotte County plates. I mean, other than the prosecutor slandering the good people of Wyandotte County, I mean, I think for your, for your argument, it is especially important if the defendant was from Wyandotte County because then you might get right. prejudiced. Right, right. Um, I, I don't know for sure whether or not he was. I would honestly have to relook at the record to see whether or not he was from Wyandotte County. At least County. we know he was driving a truck with Wyandotte County. He was County. driving a truck with Wyandotte County plates, and the, the county from which those plates were from had no other reason to be brought up other than to potentially prejudice a Johnson County jury against a Wyandotte County defendant. Um, now, moving on to the commenting on the credibility of the witness, there were two... two um, well, two related instances in which um, were brought up as improper, and one was when the prosecutor did its closing art. Well, let me just provide some context. During its case in chief, the defense called an expert to testify about a potential muzzle placement when Deputy Rokusek fired his weapon at um, Mr. Wilson as he was driving away to try to figure out where he was to support Mr. Wilson's assertion that he never actually hit that deputy. Um, defend, or prosecution then called a rebuttal witness afterwards. In his closing argument, the prosecutor referred to the defense expert, Mr. Geetson, as, Mr. I can't even remember going and seeing that gigantic suburban about a year ago traveling from Springfield to Johnson County to see it. And then, um, went on to talk about the state's expert as the real expert. Um, it was argued that this was commenting on the credibility of the witness, uh, un improperly commenting on the credibility of the witness, because it's up to the jury to determine which of the experts to believe. It's up to the jury to determine which expert is credible and which expert is not credible. Well, the witness couldn't even remember if he had... Uh examined of this truck. And I, I, I is, is counsel not allowed to to uh, comment on that or maybe even practically make light of that? I, I, I do believe that um I I I think it's the combination of the two together. I don't think standing alone him commenting on the fact that this expert couldn't remember examining the suburban um, would rise to the level of prosecutorial misconduct. It's after that stating that their expert was the real expert, which was then implying that the state's opinion that the state's expert was the only credible expert. It's giving their opinion, the state's opinion on the credibility of the witness, which would be it what was improper. It doesn't have to be credibility. It can be that the other expert is inexperienced, he doesn't have good qualifications. I mean, all that stuff is the grist of what you do in a trial. Um, I, I, I will admit that I think the um, inflammatory comment is probably the sh inflammatory straight statements is the stronger of the two prosecutorial misconduct arguments. But w we would argue that, that I, I would agree that there is nothing wrong with pointing out the weaknesses in the defense expert and the defense expert testimony. But the argument is, is that using the terms the real expert and referring to the state's expert is expressing an opinion that that expert is the only credible expert um, when it's up to the jury to determine the credibility of the witnesses. Um, so if this court fi finds that there was misconduct, then we'd move on to the plain error analysis. And there are three subparts to that analysis, ill will, gross, whether or not it was gross and, gross and flagrant, and whether or not there was no reasonable possibility that it contributed to the verdict. In determining whether or not it was gross and flagrant, um, there are different things that you can look, on, look at. And one of those things is determining whether or not it violated a longstanding rule of prosecutorial conduct. And in both instances, making comments to inflame the passions or prejudice of a jury and commenting on the credibility of a witness are both longstanding um, instances of prosecutorial misconduct in the state of Kansas. And the fact that both were done would indicate, at least support uh, argument that the prosecutors Com um, statements in this case were gross and flagrant. 
As to ill will, um, one of the things to determine is whether or not it was repeated, whether or not it seemed to be simply a um, slip of the tongue, a, something that was said in mistake. Um, first of all, the six and a half mile path of destruction, that was in both an opening and closing. So it was clearly something that was planned because the opening and closing arguments were given by two different attorneys. Um, it seemed to be a theme for the prosecution. So it, it clearly wasn't an inadvertent statement. Um, as to the statement regarding the statements about the credibility of the witnesses, it's really hard to imagine that the tongue twister that they used to call Mr. Geetson, the Mr. Yeah, that, <laughs> that that could have been an inadvertent slip of a tongue. It's, it's difficult to say even when I'm reading it. Um, okay, yeah, okay. Um, but we would argue that the repeated nature and the, um, and the, the emphasis on these comments, particularly the inflammatory statements, indicate that there was not a lack of ill will. And finally, the main two... The main two um, charges that were contested were the aggravated battery and the aggravated assault. For those two charges, the uh, credibility of Mr. Geetson and the credibility of Mr. Wilson were of utmost importance. And the claimed instances of prosecutorial misconduct would have directly attacked the credibility of both of those witnesses. One in implying that Mr. Geetson wasn't a real expert and the other in seeming to apply, imply that because he was a Wyandotte County resident. He may not have as much credibility and that he caused more destruction than he actually did. So we would argue that there was prosecutorial misconduct and it does require reversal. May it please the court, Sean Menahan, Assistant District Attorney with the Johnson County District Attorney's Office for the state. Uh, I'll stick to the prosecutorial misconduct issue. Uh, I just checked in my break, and it still said, I still cited that uh, prosecutors are given wide latitude in making arguments in a case. I still think that's the law today. Um, and when you look at a prosecutorial misconduct issue, I think that you kind of view it in, through two eyes. One, through the prosecutor, uh, through the prosecutor's eyes when he says it. Um, what was his intent or her intent in making the statement? And the other way you should view prosecutorial misconduct issues is through the jury's eyes. What would, have had, what would have the jury perceived had they received this information, had they heard this information? And I think it's pretty clear in all of these instances that a jury would look at these arguments and say the prosecutor was arguing the facts in this case. They were arguing why uh, the evidence was on the state's side and not on the defense's side. And in the context of that, they make these statements. And so I think that a, a jury and a, uh, the prosecutor's intent and that what the jury would view is pretty obvious that they would view it as argument on the evidence not the personal opinion of the prosecutor. Uh, for instance, uh, the first statement that's in their brief is the mayor, Mr. I can't even remember going and seeing that gigantic suburban about a year ago traveling from Springfield to Johnson County, Kansas to see it, which he did. Uh, that's factually correct. Uh, the defense attorney is the one that presented this evidence, that elicited this evidence from their own expert that he didn't even remember coming to Kansas City to, to view, or Johnson County to view this evidence. But he said this in the context of showing that, uh, that the expert, the defense expert, wasn't credible. So he says, uh, you know, in this same paragraph, which I've cited in my brief, how much credibility should you give a man who was so ill-prepared that he didn't remember that he traveled to Johnson County from Springfield to go see that vehicle a little bit later on? you get to decide how much credibility, how much credibility you should give someone who would not even acknowledge that wind or a sloped roadway would affect where a cartridge casing might land on the roadway. Was the jury given an instruction at the end of the trial about uh, the credibility to be given, if any, to expert witnesses? Um, you happen to know? I don't know, but I'm, it's pretty standard that they get the arguments are just that. and. 
uh, you know, if there's any evidence or any argument that doesn't support the, give, uh, the evidence presented, then you disregard it. That's a pretty typical, but I didn't, for some reason, I bring my notes on the case. I didn't, I missed it. Uh, the second argument, Jason Butel, who was the state's expert, a real expert, told you about that. So all this shiny stuff should not distract you from the physical evidence. Wow. Now, a real expert, that's not a comment. Uh, that's not a personal opinion, is it? I don't think it's a personal opinion. I think the defense expert, then we got our expert, the real expert. Well, That's not vouching for him, is it? No, I don't think that that's what it takes. But if you see it in the context of the argument... Um, I thought I just did. I, the, there's there, there's who can't even remember coming to Johnson County all the way from Springfield to see the suburban that had rolled over, and then our expert, the real expert, that isn't a personal comment. No, I don't think so. He is the one expert that actually took out Rakuk's gun and did tests on it and fired it and determined whether there's. Uh, a ejection pattern analysis in this case. That's not something that the defense attorney did, or the defense expert did, and I think that that's a fair comment that he says that he's basically showing, you know, making the statement when in the, within the context of that, showing that uh, the state's expert was the one that did the test, not the defense expert. Um, third statement uh, was about the, or third statement was six and a half a mile path of destruction. Uh, a, a prosecutor doesn't have wide discretion to make that argument. I mean, the defense concedes that he destro destroyed things on the property that he stole items from. Uh, he destroyed the vehicle that I'm not, I don't think it was, it wasn't presented at trial, in fact, but it, I think it's in the record that was stolen, uh, that the, the defendant was driving. Um, they presented evidence that he destroyed that vehicle. He did, uh, presented evidence that they totally destroyed Rokusik's uh, Suburban. I mean, that, that's pretty good evidence that he went on a, uh, went on a, basically a chase and a destruction of six and a half miles. And then finally, the, uh, the final statement, um, read as a, in a whole, uh, and I'll just point out a few sentences in this whole paragraph that I set out in my argument, or in my brief. And what we're sta uh, starting as this case, what we're saying, I think, as this case moves uh, uh, its way along is an old saying, actions speak louder than the way words. Uh, his action, every action that he took was trying to get him out of the hot water of his own making. He sees Deputy Colmeyer. He knows he's got a truck bed chock full of freshly stolen stuff. Wilson knows that if he submits and talks to Deputy Colmeyer, it's not going to be a very long, not going to be very long before Justin Colmeyer figures out this guy with Wyandotte County plays acting suspiciously in western Johnson County. There's no reason for him to be driving out in the county with a pickup truck loaded full of stuff. Uh, well, first of all, the defendant knew that he was transporting stolen items in the back of his truck. Second, uh, well, I guess he wouldn't know that the, the, uh, the police officer was there on the scene responding to a potential burglary. Um, but, uh, and then uh, this, this statement wasn't really about Wyandotte County. This was about the reasoning behind why he fled from the police officers. And, uh, you know, it's just superfluous. And I, I mean, was he from Wyandotte County? Um, I'm not sure it's in the record, but he was from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Which may be a more of a... Say, there you go. If that isn't prejudice. <laughs> that may be more of an attack on his... Uh, his uh, his name, but um, so all, there's nothing wrong with any of these statements that were made by the prosecutor. They're well within the latitude of a prosecutor to make, unless this court has any other questions. Okay, thanks. Um, the only thing I wanted to do was answer Judge Boozer's question. There was a general instruction given that it's for the jury to determine the weight and credibility of each witness, but nothing regarding specifically about experts. Thank so, you. unless there are further questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, counsel, very much for your briefs and your arguments today.
That completes this afternoon's hearings. I would like to just uh, take a few minutes here, although we're finished for the afternoon. Uh, if there's anybody that has any questions, you can certainly ask. We obviously cannot comment about the substance of any of the cases this afternoon or how we're going to decide any particular issues, but maybe we, maybe we could answer questions about the procedure of the case, or if you just have any general questions about how our court works, the Kansas Court of Appeals, or just questions about the legal profession in general, maybe if you're considering it. Feel free to ask. I see one hand there. Um, is this normal for all three of you guys to be up here, or is today just like a special? Our court always sits in panels of three judges. So it's not typical for us to come to a community college like this. We're usually at the local courthouse. But yes, the, the Kansas Court of Appeals sits in three judge panels. Any we other? rotate. So next month we'll be with different judges. Okay. Any other? Yes? I know that Missouri has a certification process for, um, for languages interpretation. And I was wondering if you had any. You saw a lot of need for it in Kansas, and if Kansas is going to start the process. I hear the first part of your question. Oh, I know Missouri has a um, certification process for world language uh, interpretation within the court system. You translate. Oh, translations? Yeah. Well, interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, and translation. And um, I was wondering if you knew, is there seem to be a great need for it oh. in the cases that you see? Certainly, and, certainly in Kansas. And we, there, there's a, a system for uh, court certified translations. And okay. we have, especially in Western Kansas and Dodge City, Garden City, uh, they have five or six different languages where they have certified court translators. Okay. Because it's not just translation, right. it's you have to understand the court system too, so you can translate it in a meaningful way. Not just the words, but you know, what does this mean? Right. So. And Kansas has started a yes, yeah, yeah, okay. for some and, time. And actually, you've hit on a real serious issue with regard to the criminal justice system, because like as the, in the areas of western Kansas, and in liberal, for example, where you're on the border there, uh, and the problem is is that the counties have to provide we're dealing with typically indigent uh, criminal defendants. So the county is the one that has to foot the tabs for these translators. And if you talk to the judges, they'll, they'll tell you out west that they're just, uh, the budget situation is awful because we have so many uh, people who do not have English as a first language. They have a constitutional right to understand the proceedings. And that costs money to bring in all those translators. So that's a real budgetary issue for our court system. Other final questions? Yes. Earlier today, you said that your court hearing, um, how many cases every year? We have about 1,800 appeals filed with our court every year. And you said that you, you hear arguments for only 400 of them? No, four, 1,400 of them are typically get to the level of where, where we issue a full blown decision. 1,400, not 400. And out of those 1,400 cases that actually make it to a docket like this, I would say about one-third of those are argued, like you just heard today. But the other two-thirds are just what's called summary uh, uh, docket. In other words, there's no oral argument. Everything else about the case is the same. We read the briefs conference the case, decide the issues, but we just do not have the opportunity to have the attorneys come and argue the case before us. There's still important cases, especially to the people, the clients, but we just don't have oral argument on them. There's just not enough time in the day, quite frankly, to do it for every case. It's a judgment call, uh, but we maybe try to look at the complexity of the case or the uniqueness of the issues. Uh, on our court, the Intermediate Court of Appeals in Kansas, 
we do see a lot of repetitious issues, a lot of issues that come case after case after case. So if your case just has those types of issues, it's unlikely that it will be set for oral argument. If it's got something unique to it, you're increasing the odds of us setting it for oral argument. But the bottom line is it comes down to a judgment call. Sometimes we set cases for oral argument that we wish we hadn't have, but, but vice versa. There's many cases that we don't set for oral argument and we wish later that we had. And we do allow people to ask for oral argument if we've put them on the summary docket. So occasionally we'll get a motion that says, hey, this is on summary docket, we'd like to argue it, and here's why it's important to argue it, and we'll consider it. Sometimes we'll grant those. Sometimes also people waive oral argument. They decided even though it's set for oral argument, we don't want to bother. Take care. Well, we enjoyed our visit here today, so, so thank you very much for coming to watch. Good morning.